morning everybody. Morning. morning. It's lovely to see you all again and a special welcome Julia. It's your first time back since um, since the lockdown, so really good to have you with Yes, you. thank you. Yeah. And I've got one advantage over around the last week anyway, at least I when I look at the clock. <laughs> this week is going to say the same the right time. So it is communion service today, so we're going to um, centre our thoughts running up to communion. Now, Tom, are you with us? So, there's a verse from Song of Solomon. I'm going to take a psalm again this morning, that's Psalm 45. But in Song of Solomon, as the bride thinks about her bridegroom, she concludes after a long description of how beautiful he is, that he is all together lovely. And that's our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Last week, I've got so many songs I could have picked this morning. Last week, Andy chose one of the songs I could have had, so that was brilliant, because I'm going to point back to one of Andy's songs from last week. There was a line in the Matt Redman song last week, which is a great song called 10,000 Reasons, and it says this, it says, For all of your goodness, I will keep on singing 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. So we're going to listen to a Phil Wickham song first, it's called Anthem, and it starts with this. The first lines are, so many reasons, too many to count, to say that I love you, to worship you now. So we're going to listen to Anthem on Phil Wickham. Beauty never 
the anchor of my soul I'm overwhelmed by all you Father, 
We thank you for your spirits and we pray that you will continue to help and bless them, encourage them, give them peace. And that uh, John will not react to the treatment he's having. We thank you that those prayers have been answered for the first round. Pray that you will let this treatment be good for him so that he will regain a really good measure of health and strength. Father, you are so, so good. All those in our families that we want to bring to you, think of us, Mum, getting older as we all want. Now with the new challenge of controlling this diabetes, pray that you help her, and pray that she will find a joy and comfort in you. So Father, our prayer this morning is that you would open the word to us, and through your spirit you would speak to us, and you would reveal something of your great love and majesty and glory to us, and draw our hearts out to you in grateful thanks and praise. As we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Notices for today. Um, just more for your prayers. Obviously, we're not expecting you to turn up, but with the um, Rock Solid, which is the older youth group, we've had a chat and decided at the moment it's not appropriate to try and do that back in church. But we want to do a more regular online um, Zoom session with them. And myself, Andy, and Buff are getting together on Monday to discuss that, so you might remember that. And the children that, of course, we don't always now see on a Sunday and certainly not on a Wednesday. Um, similarly, myself, Andy and Jeff are getting together on Wednesday for an hours meeting. Um, talking about websites and other things. So again, we appreciate your prayers and your wisdom. Next Sunday, Jeff is leading the family service. So we look forward to that as well. Thanks, Tom. You know the rules, you know the reminder, you know what's going on. So I'm not going to read it all out, but of course, I think we all feel very safe in the service and we're very grateful for that. But let's just respect each other and let's look after each other. Yes. Okay, the next song on a similar theme about how wonderful Jesus is. It's a really beautiful song, you might not be familiar with it, but it's called Isn't He? It's Jesus. This Jesus, how 
glorified and praised. And you every week but quite often 
will have a version of the psalm to listen to. This is the first song I ever heard from my friends in Texas, Shane and Shane. This is the song that made me research more of their music and find so much other beautiful music. I love this, it captures the psalm perfectly. This is Psalm 45. Yeah. 
purpose this morning isn't to give you a full exposition of the psalm. We won't have time for that, as interesting as it would be. So I just want to run briefly through the psalm and then particularly pick up on some of the main themes as we lead into our communion time. But we'll just quickly pray. Father, now we pray that you would open your word to us. Speak to us, we pray, and again we ask that you would draw our hearts out to you through your spirit. For the Lord we and we ask this. Amen. Quite a while back, you may not have been here, I spoke on Psalm 85, which was one of the Psalms of the Sons of Korah. So I'm not going to go too much into who they were and the background, but if you're familiar with the Old Testament as Moses led the children of Israel through the wilderness towards the Promised Land, they were a troublesome lot. They complained, they moaned, and they were disobedient and all sorts. And there was this particular pair called Dathan and Abiram, who was one of the Levites called Korah stirred up a terrible rebellion against Moses and Aaron. God's judgment on them was as the children of Israel came away from them, they weren't just judged and died, there wasn't any fire from heaven, but the earth opened up and swallowed them. But in his mercy and grace, this is a psalm written by the descendants of that rebellious evil man. And they then were serving in the temple and leading the praise and worship. That's not too different to us, is it? We are praising and worshipping our King, but we were rebellious sinners who had turned our back on God. As for the title, we know it's a wedding song, it's a love song. It was written, so um, good authority has it, for the wedding of Solomon and Pharaoh's daughter. But more importantly, it's a messianic psalm. That means it's a psalm that's talking about the future king, the real true king who would come, the son of David, who is the Messiah, who we know is Jesus Christ. Thanks, Tom. Now we have a good authority that this psalm is talking about Jesus, because in Hebrews there's a direct quotation of it. As the writers of Hebrews, probably Paul, is explaining how great and much better Jesus is than all sorts of things, better than Moses, better than Abraham, better than the angels. He quotes directly in saying, but about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So the theme of the psalm, thanks Don, the theme of the psalm is Jesus. And there's actually no better theme or subject we can have, is there? It's a while ago since we've had Uncle Michael with us, but he would always tell us a story, and he'd start by saying, I'm going to tell you a story about my favourite person. And of course that was Jesus. There's no better theme for us to have. There right at the start, as with having this song written for the wedding, the writer says, My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. You are the most excellent of men. Your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. There's no better subject for us to consider the only one who is worthy of our worship than Jesus. There's no better conversation we can have, no one better to turn to in our lives. And he is altogether lovely. We can't compare him to anything. This is Psalm 40, I wrote down a verse from him. Psalm 40 verse 5 says, Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak of your deeds, they will be too many to declare. So it doesn't matter how long we contemplate Jesus, how long we discuss, learn from him and about him, he will always be indescribable, he will always be too wonderful for words. 
want to do the newsletter, I'll post you a little thing on YouTube if you want to look at it. There's a great one, we played it in church before, but a great sermon where someone just pours out his heart about how beautiful Jesus is. And you get some of that theme from this psalm. If we look at the next one. This is just a glimpse in one psalm. But this is what we learn about Jesus. He's the king. He's the fairest of all and above all. He's full of grace. He's the eternal God. He's mighty and victorious. He's the ruler who will rule in truth, humility, justice, love and righteousness. How could do with rulers like that? But one day there will be a ruler like that. It will be Jesus. He's glorious. He's clothed in splendour and majesty. He's beautiful beyond words. He's joyful. No wonder that the bride in Song of Solomon that we've looked at already, as she contemplates her bridegroom, says, words are enough. He is all together. Lovely. But there's another theme there, Tom. After it's described in the bridegroom, it comes to the bride. And of course, seeing Jesus as the Messiah, that the psalm is talking about the Son of God, who's the bride? Well, the bride is us. The bride is his church for which he has paid his precious blood and died on the cross to redeem and purchase for himself. The description of the bride isn't as long, but it's still important and beautiful. As we said, we were lost in sin, yet we stand clothed in his righteousness. The bride in Revelation, the fulfilment of this, stands in want, cleansed clean by the blood and death of the Lord Jesus, dressed in robes that he has bought and prepared for her. So Jesus makes his bride honourable. Of course, without him we're dishonourable. He makes us beautiful. He gives us riches of his grace that we couldn't dream of. He brings us a gladness and a joy that we never thought we could have. He leads us to be ever present with him. Pharaoh's daughter was encouraged to forget her past and her family. We are told that we will leave all pain and trouble behind when we live with him in his home. And I love this last bit. In the psalm it says that the king will find in his bride his enthralling joy. How is it that Jesus will find his enthralling joy in the likes of us? Only because of his love and grace and what he has made us. And the Chain and Chain song picked out this verse brilliantly. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. There on the cross, in his love, his mercy and his grace, he paid the price to bring us to himself so that we could remain pure and free. I'm going to start looking forward to communion. I'm going to just read from Matthew 26. So this is of course the Last Supper. This is the night when he was betrayed before he went to the cross. And it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on, until that day when I drink it new, with you, in my Father's kingdom. Some of you on the Zoom, while we were doing services on Zoom, will have heard a rabbi talking about this that I found. So this is not me, this is something I've learnt, and he explained it so much better than I will. So apologies if you've heard this before, but I just want to touch on it before we share the bread and wine together. There at that last supper, 
when they came to take the second cup, there's a beautiful imagery in that from the Jewish scriptures and the Jewish culture. It was a betrothal cup. The groom to be would come to his bride, and rather than give a ring of engagement like we do, or maybe go down on one knee, or however else people try and celebrate that, he brought a cup of wine. He offered it to his bride, who would, in acceptance, would take the cup and would drink from it. Quite literally, the groom is declaring his love for his bride that as necessary he will protect her and love her even unto death. We of course literally know that Jesus, our Saviour, from Isaiah tells us he poured out his soul unto death. Jesus has done everything for us. His love went to the cross. But then in the Jewish culture, the groom will return home. And he wouldn't drink again, like Jesus said at the Last Supper, he wouldn't drink again until the wedding day, until they could fulfil their wedding time and live together. And Jesus is looking forward to that day when we, his church, will be together with him and he will drink that cup of joy with us. That's the betrothal. But then you come to the wedding itself. It's gone. What's the groom doing while he's gone, other than longing to come back for his bride? The groom went home to build a house. That's what he did. Often they would, of course, live with their families. And as he built and built and made it ready, the father, who would have been experienced in these things, would have been overseeing what was going on. And there would have come a time when the father would come to the son and would say, it's good enough. It's ready. Go and get your rod. You can read it for yourself there. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Then the cup of joy. The wedding itself, the making a home, the living together. This is what Jesus has done for us. This is how beautiful he is. Don't start. Quote from the song we sang. Your heart bursts at the seams, flowing with blood and with water. A song of love pouring out from the tree, singing, For the joy set before me. You ransomed your bride on the day that you died, ascended to heaven in glory. We stand clothed in white, with our voice lifted high, singing, Come and return. In the glory. Very quick personal comment, then we're going to pray. Those of you who had the privilege to be married, and of course before that the privilege to be engaged, take a little trip down memory lane. Remember what it was like. We were in different countries, in Wales and England. But the anticipation. If you'd have said to me, tell me about your bride, I would have told you all sorts, and none of it would have been bad. I would have praised her, I would have told you how beautiful she is and how wonderful she was, and no doubt if you'd have asked Buff, she would have said the same thing. There was nothing more we wanted than to reach that wedding day so we could be together. But what about our greater love? What about our love for Jesus, who is preparing a place, who has promised to come back? How much are we in similar vein? more looking forward to sharing that joy with him. And so as we have our communion together, of course, we are exclusively his. He is our first love, he should be our own love. And we worship him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are so precious to us. You are a treasure rich and rare.
aware. We thank you so much for your love to us. If you hadn't have loved us, we could never have loved you. If you hadn't have died for us, we could never come into your presence. If you had not conquered the grave and were not risen from the dead, we could have no hope that one day we would live in heaven and have eternal life with you. Lord Jesus, you are truly everything to us, as much as we confess that so often we don't live in that way. You are our all in all. You are altogether beautiful. You are the fairest of all. You are the King in power and glory and majesty. And yet the one who came humbly to die on the cross, to pay the price, to literally die for us, to win our hearts, to win our love, and to save us from our sins. We worship you now. As we share this bread together, we declare our oneness with each other and with you. And we give our most grateful thanks, Lord Jesus, for all that you are, for all that you have done, and all that you are preparing for us. We worship you now for your honour and glory. In Jesus' name. Jesus, we thank you that you poured out your life for us. There is nothing we can do to deserve it or to redeem ourselves. It is just through your precious blood. Thank you for loving us so dearly. Thank you that as we do this now in anticipation of your return, that one day we will no longer need to do it in anticipation because we will have the rejoicing of sharing the feast with you in heaven to see you as you are. And then our communion with you will be complete. We long for your return. We pray that you would show mercy to this world while you would patient wait and draw people to yourself. But Lord, we do long for the day when we will be with you. We will see you. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. Will my gaze of glory belong, my King of grace? Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The Lamb is all the glory of the Lamb's land. Bless us now as we give our thanks and we worship you and we love you.
nailed to a tree Christ our God spilling his holy blood bowing in anguish his sacred head sing to 